So we're going to go ahead and get started with our history for lunch this afternoon. We would like to welcome everyone to the Museum of the Abermiles History for Lunch. It's our second one for the month of September. And um, we, of course, we have our guests that are in person today. And we have our guests joining us from home. So if you're a guest from home, we're just going to ask you if you will please mute because um, I think we're going to have several guests joining in on our history for lunch today. So it's probably going to make it for a little bit um, more interesting history for lunch because we have several people that can um, contribute to um, our topic today. So we are discussing the book, The Lost Colony Murder on the Outer Banks, Seeking Justice for Brenda Joyce Holland. And we have our author, Mr. John Riley. And we also have um, Brenda Joyce Holland's sister, Kim, joining us today. So she will be providing us with some um, her experience throughout the um, time of the investigation and what the future um, has it holds for the case also. So Mr. Riley, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you today. Oh, well, thank y'all. Thank y'all so much for having me. Thank you, Lori. Um, I would say Kim is, um, y'all will see Kim on the screen as Elizabeth Thorne. She's using her fancy name for her sign in on Zoom, but that's um, Brenda's sister, Kim. And I know y'all have varying levels of, um, of uh, uh, involvement in the case or, or uh, in the book. So, but just for um, people that might not know the book that well, just in a capsule. So um, Kim's little big sister, Brenda, was the makeup supervisor at the Lost Colony in the summer of 1967. Um, very responsible and beloved person. And it was a big deal for her to get that job at the age of 19. And she'd been at Campbell College. Um, she was a rising junior. Um, so on the early morning hours of July 1st, 1967, she vanished. And because she was such a responsible, reliable worker, by that evening at the Lost Colony, that Saturday evening, it was a cause for major concern. And by that Monday, they were just combing the island looking for um, Brenda. And um, the, thir the following Thursday, she was found in this, her body was found in the Sound, um, where the Croatan empties into the Albemarle and she was on the mainland side um, and she was partially clothed. An autopsy would determine that um, the cause of death was ligature strangulation and that she'd possibly been raped and the case has never been solved. So I happened to enter into the case and, um, and I found um, um, Kim Thorne on Facebook and uh, we started talking about it and, and I did some columns about it for the Coastland Times and soon somebody had given me the um, SBI file on the case, which was classified and which was just fascinating. It was 400 pages and had a suicide, seances, a supposed shallow grave, all set in the summer of love, the supposed summer of love, 1967. So I knew at that point with Kim's help and the help of Claudia Fry and Buddy Tillett, who'd both been involved in the case, uh, wanted to write a book on it. And Kim and we've all worked together on it. And um, so the way we wanted to do this today is I felt like I would just do that and then let Kim speak a little bit and y'all and just let y'all feel free to come in with, um, with y'all's thoughts on the case and questions. And I know a lot of y'all grew up with it as I did. For a lot of us in the 1960s and 70s, growing up around the Outer Banks, it was just always with us. And with me, it was um, my Uncle Billy ran the Ocean House Motel, and that was where the SBI agents were actually living and working out of the case. And I can remember when I was six years old that summer, my Uncle Billy showing me the Lost Colony program right here, and he flipped through it, and he pointed to a picture of Brenda, and then he pointed to a picture of one of his, her fellow cast members, and he said, and that's who did it. And, you know, and Uncle Billy's smoking cigarettes and telling me this in the air-conditioned lobby. And I've just never forgotten that. So I'll, I guess I always kind of knew somewhere I was going to do something with this story. And I'll let Kim tell a little bit about her, what she thinks now. Well, I don't know quite where to begin. <laughs> um, it's just um, the story, of course, you know, started when I was nine years old, when, um, when this tragedy started. 
and um, of course it haunted my parents and our family for years. And um, of course, um, my family was always, um, well, for several years was updated from the law officials, you know, that, um, that Brenda's case was being worked on. And then, you know, after several years, um, they didn't hear any more about the case. And um, of course, you know, that affected them, you know, greatly that nothing was ever done, but they did not know. Um, they felt like their hands were tied and they had left it in the hands of the officials. But um, growing up, um, I always knew that um, something needed to be done. And it, it, it haunted me. And knowing that ever so many years, something would happen. Somebody would send us an article or something would transpire. It's, it was, it's just kind of um, crazy through the years how things would come to pass. And um, like the News and Observer ever um, so often would do an article on um, the mystery. And, um, but it was always on my mind. And I had lived in the mountains until I was 23 and moved down east to the Craven County area. And um, so when um, one of the most um, intriguing stories was when my mother called me and said um, there's this um, deputy sheriff that works for Dare County and I told him he needs to call you and his name is Buddy Tillett and he wants to um, talk about Brenda's case and so um, of course I called Buddy and um, me and my husband at that time we immediately went to Manio which was my first visit to Manio and uh, we met with Buddy and he um, had been working the case because he had always been interested in it being as he was raised in the area. Of course, now he was a law official and it was just something that had always been a mystery and he just, it just was on his mind. And he did a lot of background work on this. And um, then, um, things kind of died down after Buddy's work on it. And I, of course, had all the information that I could get from him written down. And I always wanted to be able to write something about it, but I'm not a writer. And so I had, you know, my, you know, little files that I had on it. And I had everything my mother had saved on it, all the newspaper articles and everything. And um, then, um, just happened to be in Durham with my husband at the VA hospital and I get this phone call from John Rayleigh. And he's like, um, can I talk to you about your sister, Brenda Holland? And I'm like, um, yeah, you know, cause I was eager to talk to anybody about her case. And when he told me he was a journalist, um, I thought my heart was gonna do flips because it was just always on my heart to get her story told. And so we immediately met with John and um, he came, of course, down east to our home and talked with me and seen all my papers and tubs of pictures and everything. And it was just on from there because um, it was just like a blessing to finally have somebody that had this, the same interest as I did to, to get her story told. So. Thank you, Kim. Does anybody have any questions at this point or comments? Okay. Um, so if you have a question from home, if you will please type your question into the chat, but I do have a question from our in-person audience. So I'm gonna let you ask your question. Kim. When did you first, what year did you first meet Buddy Tillett? And then when did you contact John about the book? What year was that? So this question is for Kim. What uh -huh. year did you meet Buddy Tillett? And then um, the last part of the question. What year did you first contact John? 
what what year was your first contact with um, Mr. Riley? Riley to it. Wow, I'm not good on on dates and years. I'm sorry, I can't answer um, that okay. exactly. Um, Do you have an approximate time period? Um, John could John could probably tell you more because he has a better memory than I do about um, the dates and years. Um, I'm not even going to guess because I'm afraid I'll say something wrong. Um, I'm trying to think and where I lived at the time and how many years it's been. So it's it's been at least um, 22 years at least ago that I met Buddy. Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe a little more than that. He, he re-entered the case in 1995. He was a deputy with Dare County Sheriff's Office. And... Um, he had always been interested in it, but he grew up in Mans Harbor and went to Manio High School. Um, and he is maybe 57, so he was a little younger than us and grew up with it too. Um, so Buddy took it upon himself to re-enter the case and jump through some hoops to, 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 to do that. And in the course of that, he contacted Kim and that would have been, this is spring of 1995, I think he's reopening it by. So, so right around that time, summer, spring 1995, Kim, I think is when you went to Manny for the first time. Thank you. And yeah. So, and Buddy um, is just a great guy. And uh, he left the sheriff's office not too long after that. And it kind of fizzled after that. But Buddy really um, found some good stuff and he entered the case with an open mind. And um, and made some good determinations and actually had someone um, tell him uh, as he was working a, a call one night in Skyco between um, between Manio and Wanchis, um, he went out and, and responded to a call and the subject he was responding to told him, he said, you know, this person confessed to me that he killed Brenda. So that was a, a big break in it, I thought. And um, Buddy now is um, living in New Hampshire with relatives and he's battling pancreatic cancer. So as Kim and I were working on the book, we always were telling him, he found out last winter, well, that, that was February or a year ago. So a year and a half ago, Buddy, as right as we're in the midst of all this, Buddy found that he had pancreatic cancer. So we would always tell him, well, you got to live to see this book come out. And he did. And he's he's been excited about it. So that makes us feel good. Um, any other questions? Yes, sir. Mr. Hogger, um, we know that you were with the SBI at the time. And would you like to share your perspective of the story? I'm not in a position to really comment on the case. I was never assigned to work the case, but having lived in Dare County and worked the area uh, in, in other assigned responsibilities and having grown up in this area, uh, I have followed the case uh, through the years and have just initiated some conversations with Mr. Raley uh, and we hope to be able to get together in the future and talk about some of the information that he has provided in the book. Thank you. Yes, y'all, and I would add to that, I have the utmost respect for Doc Hoggard, and um, he basically said, as I was interviewed him for the book, he basically said just what he said just then. Um, Doc did um, introduce um, some of the agents um, to um, Dottie Fry in 1986 um, in a very professional manner. And um, also Doc uh, went, at, at, this is in the book and Doc has told me this on the record that he went to Campbell, what, just after or just before Brenda? Uh, what was after right, Brenda, right. yes. Right, so yeah, so that, that those are just things that are in the book, but yeah, I have the utmost respect for Doc and look forward to getting to know him a lot better. And he he was very gracious in, in responding to my request for information on the book. Mr. Hornthal, you have another. I just wonder what, what you can tell us about the confession of this person. Is it apparent somebody who confessed to the crime? What could you tell us about the person that supposedly co that confessed to the crime? Not much. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, y'all. Um, but we, we, Kim and I ha have had a policy throughout these interviews um, that because a lot of people still haven't read it, that we're not going to give it away. 
Um, but we we met we make the case and and we say at the end who we thought think did it. Um, and um, we did that after interviewing a lot of people, including pathologists, detectives, both inside and outside the case. And um, and I, I was using, Kim was using everything she had ever learned about the case. I was using everything I'd ever learned about it as an investigative reporter. And now I do mitigation investigations on death penalty cases for the state, just establishing the social histories of death penalty defendants. So I kind of know my way around that field. And, and like I say, I've been an investigative journalist all my life. So I, I and worked a lot with um, law enforcement officers and defense attorneys and defense investigators. So I kind of had a feel for it. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's six major suspects. And so it's a, it's a lot to work through and you can see why um, that uh, Sheriff Cahoon and that initial SBI agents, initial SBI agents on the case um, really liked um, some certain suspects on it. So I guess we, one thing we could do today um, between our guests that are joining us in person and our guests that are joining us virtually if you could maybe um, give a thumbs up through chat to see how many had heard of the case. And if I could maybe get a hands up in for our in-person guest today to see if any of you all had heard of the case. So I actually have three in-person guests that know of the case. Um, nobody has responded from home. So um, what you can easily do is just click on the little chat um, icon at the bottom of your screen. And if you would like to put the answer or just a thumbs up or just yes, that would be great. Good. And speaking of that, Lori, is Lucian Morissette in the audience, in the live audience or the virtual audience? This Mr. Morissette? I, I don't... Is, no, sir, he is not. Okay. So we've actually had, um, we're, we are getting some responses. We're getting um, a yes. Um, oh, we also have another question. Was any motive ever discovered? Um, there was there were different motives that were explored. Um, I think that um, early on, um, one of the main suspects, it was thought that that um, they had, you know, that this was her last date, and that that perhaps so, something happened as they were in his bedroom, and perhaps he had killed her during the course of that. Um, then there was a. Then there was a, um, a case, the case had um, African-American suspects. It had one gay suspect. At one point, a gay suspect, he was suspected because in, the, in, in that time, in 1967, they were some, the, the early investigators were somehow equating um, homo, homosexuality with homicide. They actually thought that this gay suspect who lived with, the, with Brenda's last date that he may have killed her because he was jealous of the heterosexual of, her, of his heterosexual housemate, which didn't make a lot of sense. But that's actually in the file that that was one thing that was explored. Um, there was another. And what's fascinating about the case is at the time Brenda vanishes, I think she was walking home from her last day, at Danny Barber's house. And I think um, there were several main suspects that were all known to be driving around that area on Burnside Drive, which is right, if you're coming down 64 in Manio and you take a left right in the library, that's Burnside. At that time, um, Burnside was outside the Manio town limits. It was in Dare County. It was not lit. Um, so Brenda's walking home on that road. I think, and I've studied the moon that night, I think it was just a crescent moon, so real dark. And you've got the main suspects driving all around that area. So all coming, so there was, it's it's a it's a hard case to handle because Sheriff Cahoon, while a good lawman up until that time, he had had nothing really but Saturday night cuttings and shootings, which you pretty much know going into it who did it. And this was a major case of it was not going to be easy to solve. To Cahoon's credit, he brought in the SBI early on. So 
So uh, with I, yes, see, a question from Robin with enhancements to DNA testing. Is there any um, valuable evidence for testing? No, that's been real frustrating, uh, Robin. Um, Kim and I lived through that in this as we were really getting going on this in the summer of 2018. After our column started in the Coastland Times, um, the SBI reopened it and assigned cold case investigator Tony Cummings to it. But he always told us, he said, you know, with these cold cases, they're not going to be solved on anecdotal or circumstantial evidence. You need, we need um, hard physical evidence th through a hit, through some of the old evidence, a DNA hit. Um, unfortunately, so right around the time that uh, Tony came in, at one point, Tony interviews Dottie Fry's daughter, Claudia, and let me sit in on that interview. And Tony's telling us, you know, we're having a hard time finding the physical evidence. And that was like a Wednesday in June in 2018, a Wednesday afternoon. And I remember going back to my brother's cottage where I was staying and um, get back. And I think it was by that night or the early next morning, Patty McQuillan, spokeswoman for the SBI, sends me a note saying the, the evidence is gone. Nobody can say what happened to it. I think it happened right around the end of Cahoon's tenure. It's the policy of local um, departments to send off their evidence to the SBI for testing. The SBI usually sends it back to those departments after some time. Um, in old cases, it's not unusual for departments for storage reasons to destroy evidence, but in very high profile cases like this one, Unsolved, it was unusual and it's not known what happened to it, but the evidence is totally gone. So all DNA, gone, any, any DNA possibilities gone. Um, Kim and I both, and I think the SBI requested all separately it, the, the autopsy was done in Virginia because in 1967, North Carolina had no state system of um, pathologists, which they have now. So it was done in Virginia, and they don't even have a record of the autopsy, no photos, no nothing. I mean, at one point, cold case agent Cummings told us, if, if you can just get us a photo of her corpse, there might be something I can work from that. And we couldn't find that. Um, it was just a series of mishaps. Um, at that point, the um, local departments would call in state troopers to, to take photos. Cahoon called in a state trooper to the crime scene or, or where they recovered um, Brenda's body. And, and he took pictures and he turned them into Capitol camera in Raleigh and they came out blank. Um, uh, legendary Outer Banks photographer, Acock Brown also took pictures. Several people saw him, saw those photos in his office, um, but nobody can find them now. Um, Acock's family generously gave um, thousands of his photos to the Outer Banks History Center in Manio, but um, but those, the corpse photos are not among them. I was asking if Lucian is there, um, because I put this in the book, Lucian Morissette of Elizabeth City as a teenager, he was playing with a friend of his, and they were at um, SBA agent Lenny Wise's house um, in Elizabeth City, and th this was wrong, they, but they're teenage boys and should have been doing it, but they go through his files, and they see they see Brenda's, um, the photos of Brenda's corpse, and Lenny's described those to me, and I know he was right on target from, from other descriptions I've gotten of them. So those were probably photos, obviously were photos that ACOC had taken, but we, we cannot find them. And so um, we know the clothes were washed before they were sent off to the, S to the FBI at that time for testing. Um, and people said, yeah, but they've been in the sound anyway. But still, who knows what kind of fibers they, they might have had on them. And even for 67, that's a no-no. We know that, um, that Sheriff Cahoon gave the necklace that Brenda's, when they found a necklace on Brenda's corpse that she proudly had worn for Miss Congeniality from the 1966 Haywood County beauty pageant, um, Sheriff Cahoon gives that necklace to um, Brenda's dad in Manio. He was down there helping in the search too, the hours after the body was found. And it stayed with the family. In fact, Kim has showed me the necklace. Um, so it's, it's incredible that um, Sheriff Cahoon and the SBI did not hold that, that necklace as evidence. Um, I don't think the necklace was what strange. Sheriff Cahoon actually said in the late eighties after he retired that it, he came out with, he, he felt that Brenda was probably smothered maybe with a pillow, um, which didn't make sense because the pathologist had twice told him that it was ligature strangulation. And then Sheriff Cahoon said, he said also that necklace around her neck, who knows that could have strangled her, which I, I just don't think that. The necklace was very thin. 
I don't think it was strong enough, but I think it could have had fibers within its within its braid of of what did strangle, which I believe to be a rope a, a rope type object. Any other questions? Yeah, we do. Did you? Of all the suspects, how many were friends, acquaintances, and how many are still alive? Um, friends, friends or acquaintances of who? Brenda. Bren, a Brenda. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So none of the main suspects are still alive. Um, only one. Okay. So one was her last date and one lived in the house with her last date. So those two she would have known. Um, and I don't think she knew any of the others. Kim, let me know if I'm missing anything there, but I don't think so. I don't think she knew any of the others. Yeah. But none of them are alive. Right. Did any of the six major suspects have criminal records? Prior criminal records? Did any of the suspects have prior criminal records? Very light. Um, one of them had a record um, as a, he'd been arrested in Chapel Hill as a peeping Tom. So that put the spotlight on him. Um, and the case was dismissed, but his co-defendant on that kind of threw some, threw some shade on why it was dismissed and what happened there. So, so that was intriguing. And I think that made Cahoon and the SBI look at that particular suspect all the, all the more. Um, we tried to find records on all the suspects we could, unfortunately, because of the time, um, could not find on some. And I think the, the ones we not could not find, I'm pretty sure if any, what was there was probably um, minor. I know the dentist allowed to the two officers that he did his, the most he'd had was some traffic tickets. Um, the dentist, though, had also had an army record of some irregularities, including trying to kill himself while he was with as an army doc. So there were some interesting records there, but but no nothing that nothing that um, the David Whaley another suspect who was kind of like um, something out of the Brat Pack except from 1967 he had dropped out of ECU um, he lived um, right in Mother's Vineyard with with his uh, Mother Vineyard with his um, grandfather who was the um, um, rector at St Andrews the big um, preppy Episcopal church in Nags Head. So, you know, these are highfalutin folks and he lives just a few doors down from the dentist. And David Whaley would ride around with Manio's town watchman, Dennis Midget, um, who was this beloved guy. He had a, um, a heavy speech impediment, was mentally challenged, but he would go around and check the doors in Manio at night and the lawmen loved him and the locals loved him. And so um, David Whaley and Dennis were kind of an odd match, this blue collar boy and this preppy boy, but they would ride around together um, late into the night. And they, so they were riding around Brenda's area. And at one point, um, uh, um, a former man, the, the, the Manio police chief at the time pressured um, pressured um, Dennis into uh, speaking out against David Whaley. And we lay out in the book how that turned out. So all kinds of fascinating turns in it. How far was Brenda's home or apartment from the home of her last day? How far of a walk was it between where Brenda was staying and where her last mm -hmm. date was? Oh not even a mile, probably just maybe half mile to three quarters of a mile. Um, but so the last date was on Burnside Road, about uh, probably three quarters of a mile down from the library. And then she was staying on and what she's now Ananias Dare Street. And then it was um, then it was called Main Street. Um, and she was staying with the Twyford family, um, Cora Gray and Dick, who were just real great, beloved family in town. In fact, the night Brenda disappeared, um, one of the Brenda's last date, Danny Barber, put himself in hot water because he said uh, everybody, of course, knew everything in the lost colony. So they, they knew that that was Brenda's last date. So, so Rennie Rains, who was the matriarch of the lost colony, she was the costumer and really well respected. So she said, well, 
Danny, didn't you drive Brenda home last night? He said, oh, yes, ma'am. I, I left her at the Twyfords. And Cora Gray Twyford, her landlady, who is just, just wonderful. And she looked all the more forthright because she was a colonist and she was wearing this long white dress. So she stood right up and she said, no, Danny, you didn't bring Brenda home. And so that's when he majorly kind of put the, put the, put the hard look on himself. And we did have an, um, a question. Um, the question was, would there be any worth in it zooming the bo Brenda's body? Um, I'll let Kim say too. I think there was some talk one time of that, but I think it would be, it would be a false errand at this point with no DNA to compare it to. I think, I think Kim's family would probably say if you had DNA, sure. But Kim, wasn't it talking somebody, some, I heard this rumor one time that somebody said, well, you could exhume her body. And then Kim's family said no. But, you know, it was kind of it's all moot because there was no DNA. And you, you speak to that, Kim. Well, yeah, the, we didn't see any purpose in exhuming her body if there was so many suspects. I mean, what are you going to what are you going to compare her DNA to? Um, the lack of evidence. There's no evidence to get anyone else's DNA from. So you're looking at so many different suspects, um, even what Buddy had shared with us on how many suspects there were. If, if her body was exhumed, I mean, some of these people were already dead. Their bodies would have to be exhumed or some of them were cremated. So it was fruitless. There, my parents just would not have done it. Their, their faith would not have done it. Um, they were resolved to let it, let it be. Additional questions? Okay. Um, anybody um, online would like to have um, additional questions online? Well, I'd go back to um, talking about just exhumation makes me think about um, <clears throat> where Brenda's buried is what what's the church, the Baptist church that that Kim's family went to. And um, they had started out, I think the church really started out in the 60s. And Brenda was just a beloved figure at that church. And she would show up with just children clinging to her like ornaments on a Christmas tree. And the family had bought um, plots in the in the cemeteries. The church began, and I think Kim's parents, who were um, shotgun and um, Jerry, had always thought they would be the first to be buried there. And so, in one of those cruel tricks of fate, there there goes their 19 year old daughter being buried there. And it was that funeral. It was. Uh, just just packed and I've seen just cars parked up and down the roads and and um there were some people that came from Manio for it and um a light rain was falling during the funeral and it stopped as um the coffin was lowered which is you know some kind of sign and simultaneously um there was a funeral going on for in Manio and that was all the lost colony cast and crew were there and um, at the same time, I mean, they're noticing Danny Barber's not there. And at the same time, Danny's being questioned by the SBI over in Cahoon's office, which is at that time in the old courthouse and the jail was um, adjacent to it, almost really in the same building. And so you can imagine what Danny Barber's going through because he knew that that jail was right beside that courthouse. And he knew, he knew where Central Prison was too. And he, so it had to be some real, real fear going through him. And this is also going on in 1967, um, uh, the Miranda decision about, you know, reading rights had just come, what, the summer before. And so, and Cahoon would say in interviews, he would allude to, you know, the, the rules they had to play by. At one point he said, you know, if we could have just put one of these guys in jail for a little bit, let him sweat it out, we might could have got somewhere. So there was that going on too. So if you are interested in the book, the museum shop has um, 
the book in um, the shop. So you can call if you're online and if you would like to have one um, mailed to you, just give Miss Mary Temple a telephone call at 252-331-4026. And she can take all of your information. I know so far the book has been very popular and um, we've already had to do a reorder on the book. So there is a lot of interest. I think a lot of interesting information has been shared today. We would like to thank everyone for joining us. Um, thank you, Mr. Rayleigh, for joining us. Thank you, Mrs. Thorne, for joining us also, and Mr. Hogger for your input too. Um, any other questions before we end our program today? Okay, well, again, thank you to everyone. Oh, I do, um, well, no, just thank you. This will be a future book club selection for us for sure. Oh, well, thank you, Mary. And my, my email is rayleighjb at gmail.com. And if you lose that, Lori can um, tell you how to find me. And I'm also on Facebook just under John Rayleigh. So I'll be glad to do that. And, and I believe, Kim, I'm sure would be too. And I believe you're working on another book, if I'm correct. Yes, I'm working on a book about Andy Griffith's special relationship with Roanoke Island and how it formed him as an artist from the time he was in the Lost Colony and how he gave back to it. And the doors the sources and the doors that opened to me working on the Brenda book led to the Andy book because people would just be saying, yeah, well, Andy was saying this. And, you know, I'd, I'd grown up in Nags Head and, but Mania was a whole nother nut to crack. And it all of a sudden hit me that 10 years after we well, were going on 10 years after Andy's death, people were finally ready to talk his inner circle. And it's just fascinating stories. As, as he often said, he was no Sheriff Taylor. Very complex character, but very good man and very good Islander and really gave back to that place. So we'll definitely have to have you book back once your um, book is published. Well, thank you. Thank y'all for having me. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. Everyone have a great day and stay safe. Thank, thank you. you, Lori. Thank you, Lori. Thank you.